One of the viewers of these video lectures uh, made the very helpful suggestion that um, I do a talk on the topic of reality testing. Thank you, Elizabeth, for this suggestion. And I'm going to attempt to do that now. Um, first of all, I think we need to clarify what we mean by reality. Um, I am a philosophical realist in the sense that I believe that a real world does objectively exist out there. Um, I have always resisted extreme social constructivism or reality constructivism. The idea that reality is a socially and linguistically constructed reality, um, which need not, but often does take the extreme form of essentially denying uh, any obdurate reality beyond um, human constructive activities. Uh, I find this extreme uh, very often in the thought of postmodern thinkers like Michel Foucault, uh, who argues that um, all knowledge is built up within uh, differing epistems, differing epistemological and cultural frameworks. Um, I reject that kind of extreme relativism. Uh, so I'm a philosophical realist. Um, I would go so far as to say that I am even a positivist, but only in so far as the physical and biological natural world is concerned. Um, the methods of science um, are applied in the study of the physical and biological worlds. I've always subscribed essentially to the so-called three worlds hypothesis um, associated with um, a Russian scientist, I'm not quite sure of the name, Verdansky, um, and uh, the thought of the uh, French philosopher Henri Bergson, um, thinkers like Teilhard de Chardin have subscribed to this. This is the idea that uh, world one is the lithosphere, sometimes called the geosphere. This is the, the dead material planet. Uh, and then at some point, life emerges uh, and spreads over the planet. And we have world two, the biosphere. The evolutionary process takes place here. Uh, Darwinian uh, mutation, selection, and evolution from the simplest unicellular to multicellular to invertebrates to vertebrates to mammals to primates and then to man. Um, okay, the evolutionary process applying to world two, the biosphere, and then at a certain point of complexification, we have the sudden emergence of the newosphere, world three, which is the world of mind and culture, the psychosocial world of uh, human symbolic functioning. Uh, the child emerges into the newosphere sometime during the second year of life. Piaget uh, dated the beginning of language, the eruption of language to about 18 months. Some people see it happening earlier in the second year of life, but the, the child who up until this point has belonged only to worlds one and two suddenly emerges into world three. And of course, this is mythically symbolized in Genesis where the eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge uh, leads not only to awareness of good and evil, the emergence into a moral and ethical world, 
but also the emergence of self-consciousness. They knew that they were naked and uh, fashioned fig leaves to cover themselves. So this is emergence into self-awareness, self-consciousness, shame, guilt, and the emergence of freedom, the need to make choices and the fear and trembling, according to Kierkegaard, that uh, comes from awareness of having to make choices, not always reversible. Uh, along with this then comes existential anxiety, not the same as neurotic anxiety, but the anxiety that all human beings uh, have to bear because we have to make choices, um, and we do so often in fear and trembling. So existential anxiety, existential guilt, uh, awareness of um, the consequences of our actions and guilt regarding the choices that we make. Uh, so for me, this involves the emergence essentially into uh, the third world, which really requires existential philosophy. And of course, I think the Abrahamic religions are implicitly existentialist in that they all attribute a degree of freedom and hence responsibility to human beings. So the existentialist paradigm um, is, is, in my view, essential in order to understand uh, human functioning as a world three, as well as a world two and world one creature. Of course, we are material things and we are biological beings, we are animals, but unlike any other animal species that we know of, we are burdened with symbolic consciousness and the self-consciousness and the anxiety that comes with this. Okay, uh, so insofar as we are studying worlds one and two, I'm a positivist. The methods of the natural sciences are applied. Uh, and, and here, uh, what Freud called reality testing, um, is embodied in the scientific enterprise, which is a communal enterprise. Um, there has to be consensus within the scientific community to validate um, uh, the facts and experimental results and empirical observations. Um, uh, I, insofar as worlds one and two are concerned, I like the philosophy of Sir Karl Popper uh, that science is a matter of trying to achieve better and better approximations to an ultimately incompletely knowable reality. Not ultimately unknowable, ultimately incompletely knowable. We will never know reality completely, but in natural science, we seek better and better approximations to it. Um, okay, but when we turn, turn to world three, uh, the human world of mind and culture, uh, the methods of the physical and biological sciences are inadequate. Physical and biological science, positivism, is suitable for the study of objects. And human beings certainly are objects, and therefore we can acquire natural scientific knowledge of human beings as physical and biological things. But insofar as we inhabit world three, we are not merely objects, we are also subjects. We are both subjects and objects, and in order to study our emergent subjectivity, uh, we need to supplement the methods of the natural sciences with what Wilhelm Delphi, Max Weber, and many others uh, have referred to as the method of Verstehen, uh, which is the method of empathic understanding, psychoanalyst Heinz Kohut, I think had obviously 
um, studied Dilthai, Weber, and was well aware of the Verstein approach, which is the approach of empathy, of empathic understanding through what the philosopher George Mead uh, called role-taking, which is an imaginative activity whereby we imagine ourselves in the other person's shoes. We imagine what the other may be thinking and may be feeling. Now, we cannot know this directly. The other always retains an element of mystery to us. This is imagination. We are hypothesizing uh, what the other may be feeling by placing ourselves in the other person's situation, uh, by imagining how we would feel if we were in that situation. And this is not direct knowledge, but sometimes we are uh, better able to approximate knowledge of the other. And sometimes, sometimes we... Um, assess the other's experience poorly. Sometimes we do it much better. And uh, here the whole subject of narcissism becomes relevant on the level of World 3, on the level of, of human beings. Um, following Melanie Klein, uh, our first position, uh, our first way of experiencing is what she called the paranoid schizoid, position, which is the narcissistic position. Um, we are almost entirely self-concerned. This reaches an extreme, of course, in psychosis, where a person is very uh, little able to assess uh, the external world. Uh, he sees himself absolutely as the center and he is extremely self-concerned. But according to Kleinian theory, the paranoid schizoid position is a layer of the mind. It's not a stage that we ever entirely overcome. We may build on top of it, but we don't ever entirely transcend it. So no one ever entirely transcends their narcissism. Um, some people are better able to move on to what Klein called the depressive position or the reparative position, where finally we acquire the capacity for concern for the other, as Winnicott puts it. And at that point, other people actually become real. They're not merely any longer objects for our manipulation. Uh, we develop a capacity for empathy towards the other. Uh, we develop a capacity for concern for the other as we move into the depressive position. But no one ever achieves the depressive position completely. We fluctuate throughout our lives between PS and D. Those people who have fairly well established themselves in D, the depressive position, periodically regress into PS, which is a regression into narcissism. And when we are narcissistic, we are concerned only for our own survival, our own pleasure. Uh, here is where the pleasure principle operates. We seek to maximize our pleasure and minimize pain, as Freud describes it. Um, uh, this is a hedonistic philosophy. Uh, I'm out to maximize my pleasure and minimize my pain. And I'm not very concerned about others other than as means, not very much as ends in themselves. Um, so this is life in the paranoid schizoid or narcissistic uh, position. And when I'm ensconced in PS, I'm very uh, hampered in my ability to reality test in the sense of testing the reality of other people. Um, I'm seeing other people primarily through, as Klein describes it, the mechanisms of projection and introjection. I'm blurring the boundary between self and others. I'm seeing myself in the other. I'm seeing the other in myself. 
Um, so uh, Freud himself, in his 1914 essay on narcissism, um, is very good on this, um, and and really was getting in that 1914 essay at, at, at something that Klein would would very much elaborate on lately. Namely, uh, Freud distinguishes between narcissistic love, narcissistic relating, as opposed to what he regarded as true object love. In narcissistic love, I see the other as myself, as the self that I am, or the self that I once was, or the self that I would like one day to be. But basically, I'm simply seeing myself in the other. I'm seeing the other as myself. And narcissistic people who, quotes, fall in love, um, are usually falling into the illusion that the other is the self. And these love affairs usually explode pretty quickly um, in the light of the emergence of difference. The fact that the other is not me, the other is not the self I was or the self I would like to be. I encounter the reality of the otherness and the difference of the other. And the narcissistic illusion of oneness and sameness is uh, disrupted and um, the love affair comes to a, a rapid um, conclusion. So uh, Freud um, adopts the, the ethic, really, that we must learn to, to love or we must fall ill and, and we will be ill if we are unable to love. So the ethic there is clearly uh, the goal of development is a one-way arrow from narcissism towards object love. Freud was uncomfortable with this and uh, seldomly talked about this quite so clearly as he did in 1914 because, of course, he hated religion. And uh, this ethic of, of transcending narcissism in favor of object love um, was, was brought him too, too, too closely into contact with the major religions, and he was uncomfortable about that. So he usually tried to substitute uh, a medical language of leaving uh, illness or psychopathology behind and moving towards health. But really, what he was really talking about is transcending narcissism in favor of love, of seeing the other as other, warts and all, and learning how to love the other despite the difference. Okay, um, so on the interpersonal level, reality testing is extremely challenging because we have to overcome our narcissism. Now, of course, the same is true in positive natural science. One of the things Freud liked about science was precisely that it challenged our narcissism. We want to believe that our theory is correct. We find ways of empirically testing it. The results come in, and it turns out our theory may be false, in which case it has to go into the garbage can, or it has to be radically revised. Uh, and this is an insult to our narcissism. This is a, a wound. Uh, we want to believe we have the truth, but the evidence indicates we do not, and so we have to drop that theory or significantly um, revise it to accommodate the facts. Um, so, uh, but also in the, in the human realm, uh, we're faced with the same problem, the same challenge. We're trying to test the reality of our perception of the other. Is the other person thinking what I think he or she is thinking? Is he or she feeling what I imagine he or she is feeling? Or am I really lost in my illusions about the other? And of course, interpersonal relations often entail a good deal of disillusionment. We find that our vision of the other person um, turns out to be fallacious, 
and the other uh, has characteristics we had not seen, did not wish to see. We were lost in our illusions regarding the other. This doesn't always happen. Sometimes people have become uh, very good at their reality testing uh, of the nature and the states of mind and emotion of other people. Um, this, is a, this is a skill. This is a talent. Um, certainly people in my profession, psychoanalysis, uh, have to uh, develop this skill to a fairly high degree. But I think it was Freud himself who pointed out that um, psychoanalysts are generally not uh, great judges of character in the, in the sense that uh, in the practical life people often are, um, because we have all the time in the world to get to know the other. Um, the patient is coming several times a week. Uh, the therapy is not a short-term therapy. It's a long-term therapy. We have lots of time to get to know the other in depth. We're not very good at uh, sizing people up in um, practical daily encounters. Um, but we ought to be pretty good at getting to the truth about the other or a good deal of the truth about the other through the regular meetings um, and the free association and other elements of the analytic situation so that over time uh, our reality testing, our testing of the reality of the other um, should be getting more and more accurate, hopefully. But it's a challenge. People wear masks. Um, people seek to deceive themselves and they seek to deceive others. Uh, Self-deception, masks, lying. Uh, these are realities which make testing of the reality in regard to other people very difficult. Now, of course, I not only have to reality test vis-a-vis -vis others, I have to reality test vis-a-vis -vis myself because of course I deceive myself. Um, um, I lie to myself. I have illusions, sometimes delusions about myself. Freud made that important distinction between illusions and delusions. Delusions are beliefs that are scientifically known to be false, but the delusional person believes what is known to be false anyway. Uh, illusions are a different matter. Illusions are, are regarding beliefs that cannot scientifically know, be known to be true or false. They can't scientifically be either proved or disproved. For example, belief in a supernatural god. Uh, Science cannot prove that a supernatural god does not exist any more than it can prove that a supernatural god does exist. But many people go on and believe in the existence of a supernatural god, uh, even though uh, it can't be proven to be true. They do so because they wish it to be true, and that is Freud's definition of an illusion. A belief that can neither be proven nor disproven, but which is believed because one wishes it to be so. Delusion is believing something widely known to be false. Okay, um, reality testing in the social field is difficult because I have to get past my own narcissism. And reality testing vis-a-vis -vis the self is very difficult because, once again, I have to get past my, uh, my narcissism. Um, you know, Freud famously um, expressed great reservations regarding the possibility of self-analysis because he said the counter-transference is too strong. Counter-transference being the analyst's love for the patient. When I'm the analyst and I'm the patient, my love for myself 
My counter-transference love for myself seriously interferes with my ability to know myself. I love myself too much to surrender my illusions uh, because it is painful to surrender illusions. Uh, so we often don't get so far with self-analysis. I've had the experience of helping certain patients um, try to improve their reality testing in regard to others. Uh, I'm thinking of several men and also a few women who have decided that they were uh, in seriously flawed marriages and they decided to get out of those marriages and once out they started dating. Um, they got out of the bad marriage because of qualities of their partner that they found uh, impossible. Um, and so they start dating looking for a partner who will be much better uh, and very often uh, they start out by finding uh, another who is clearly worse than the partner they just left. Um, and they come to me and tell me what's happened on these dates. And I do my best to help them uh, see what's going on. Uh, I help them uh, learn to ha how to add up two and two and come up with four. I help them see how they are repeating the very pattern that got them into the bad marriage that they have just left. Only they've gone from um, the frying pan, possibly headed right into the fire. And sometimes I'm able to help pull them out of the fire help pull themselves out of the fire by seeing more accurately what the other is up to. Um, and so they remove themselves from that and they keep dating and next person is a little bit better. And this goes on over a while and then maybe they come up uh, with someone who appears to be pretty solid pretty responsible, pretty sane, pretty loving, not so sociopathic, not so manipulative. And they often have uh, resistance to recognizing uh, this much better picture because of course part of them is caught in a repetition compulsion, part of them is looking for pain uh, because of their guilt. Um, but we work on that, and maybe then, finally, they're able to see mm, this is a person who can love, um, and this is a person that uh, is worth investing my time and my trust and my capacity for love. Uh, maybe this is a relationship worth investing in. Now, all of this involves reality testing. Um, and looking for contradictions and weighing evidence. Um, so it's hard work. Um, it requires overcoming one's deeply rooted biases. It means overcoming one's blindness. Uh, I've worked with a number of men who are uh, very good at defending themselves in their business relationships with other men. Uh, they don't let themselves be taken advantage of. Uh, when they are bullied, they can stand up for themselves. When they are attacked, they can fight back. Uh, they can see through a lot of the nonsense. Um, but some of these men are helpless when um, they face a manipulative or sociopathic woman. Uh, the woman has them for breakfast. Uh, all of the 
self-protective uh, capacities that they have vis-a-vis -vis exploitive men uh, are lost to them when they face an exploitive woman. Of course, they're deeply sexist. I mean, they place women on some kind of pedestal, and I mean, I think they don't entirely believe that women are actual human beings, persons. They're some sort of idealized figure, and they are unable to see um, when, when this woman is bad, and they're unable to defend themselves. Uh, hopefully through our work they begin to overcome this crazy idealization of the female. They come to see women as people, and people come in all varieties, some good, some not so good, some outright bad, and um, they gradually grow in their ability to protect themselves. Um, and of course this works both ways. Uh, many women repetitively involve themselves with men who are fraudulent and manipulative and domineering and abusive. And my work with them is to help them see this and understand the roots of this and help them begin to see the signs uh, uh, so that they can weigh the evidence and protect themselves. Okay, this is all the work of reality testing. So being open and on the lookout for contradictions, for lies, uh, being alert to the evidence and being able to weigh the evidence um, and gradually move towards a conclusion, uh, an assessment, an evaluation. Um, this is uh, an attempt to enhance a person's capacity for reality testing in the field of social relations. And of course, it requires overcoming one's wishful illusions and overcoming one's narcissism and being genuinely open to the reality of the other. Of course, reality testing uh, of this sort is not uh, absolutely opposed to idealization. Sometimes idealization is merited. Uh, we find that the other is admirable. We find that the other is talented. Uh, we find that the other has a really good heart um, and has intelligence and has creativity and uh, the capacity to love and to forgive. Um, we discover that the other has evolved and is mature. And we idealize, we do not idolize this, but we, uh, we value it highly because these are desirable traits. This is what we want to find in a partner. And so we idealize. Um, we want to keep our eye on the idealization. We don't want to overdo it because that way we're setting ourselves up for disappointment because after all, however ideal, the other is a human and humans are flawed and will sometimes fail and will sometimes disappoint us. But uh, a degree of idealization of the other is essential, uh, but it should be merited. It should um, emerge after a careful study of the other. And all of this takes time. Uh, this research into the nature of the other uh, should not be impulsive. I mean, the act of falling in love can be quite impulsive, but it should be followed by a lengthy period of reality testing uh, to see whether the other really is as good as she or he appears to be. Um, that's research into the nature of the other, and it takes some time. And of course, research into the nature of the self takes time. Um, the early analysts might 
conduct an analysis over about a three-month period, and soon it was uh, a year, and then it became two or three years, and sometimes we have very lengthy analyses that are actually moving, but um, some analyses take a good deal of time. Uh, the person may be heavily lodged and fixated in the paranoid schizoid position, heavily stuck in narcissism, and that transformation, that conversion from PS, a life in PS, to a life um, more so in the depressive reparative position, that's a conversion that does not happen overnight. Uh, I mean, elements of it may happen suddenly, but uh, it then needs to be worked through and repeated uh, over and over again, because there will be regressions into PS, regressions because of the painful recognitions that are involved in moving into the depressive position. Uh, the pain of seeing through one's false self, um, the pain of recognizing one's fraudulence, uh, the pain of letting go of illusions and delusions, um, the need to face and bear anxiety, to face one's guilt and one's regrets, this is all necessary in order to begin to test reality accurately. And of course, this is uh, a process of growth, and it takes a considerable period of time to evolve in this way. Of course, today uh, we're living in a time when uh, some people perhaps a large number of people believe we are living in a post-truth era. Shocking idea to me. Um, but I recognize that the ability to test reality is not that widespread. I mean, the scientists are, there's, there's a large consensus among scientists that we are facing the reality of ACD, anthropogenic climate disruption, and yet there are all of these masses of people who are, are in denial of climate disruption. Um, there are masses of people who cannot think rationally. They don't understand that we are not supposed to hold contradictory beliefs. They seem to feel it's okay to hold contradictory beliefs. Um, they seem not to understand that uh, we should avoid lies or that we should know the difference between the truth and a lie. Um, there are people who do not understand how to reason properly. The uh, political psychologist Robert Altemeyer, um, his research uh, demonstrates that um, both right wing, although his work focused more on the right wing, it's a flaw in his work to have not extended this also to elements of the left, but ideologists of both the right and the left can't think very well. Um, some of them just refuse to think. They're probably quite capable of it, but they refuse to do so. But others seem genuinely not to have learned how to think, not to have learned that contradictions are a challenge to overcome the contradictions. Um, the, this kind of critical reason, this kind of critical thinking, uh, is a skill that a lot of people just don't have. They have not been taught. Um, at the university where I taught for many years, we had first year courses called Modes of Reasoning. And uh, they were devoted to teach the skills of critical thinking. Uh, and I found them to be very valuable courses. The students who, who did them and took them seriously often 
did quite well in their later years of study because in first year they learned how to think logically and distinguish between irrelevant arguments and relevant ones. They learned how to um, set aside merely ad hominem arguments. Um, so uh, this is a, a type of, of, of thinking that needs to be learned and if reality testing is going to evolve and develop and be useful whether one is thinking about others or thinking about oneself. I've always found it disappointing and sad that in psychoanalysis itself um, we have widespread failures of reality testing and the application of critical reason because so many practitioners glom on to one of the paradigms of contemporary psychoanalysis. They become ideologically committed to one school of thought, ideological Freudians, ideological Kleinians, ideological Cohusians, ideological Lacanians, and they refuse to do critical and comparative study across the paradigms. They dismiss the thought advanced by members of the other paradigms instead of trying to see what the Freudians got enduringly right despite what they got wrong, what the Kleinians got enduringly right despite what they got wrong, etc., etc. That kind of critical and comparative study is essential if psychoanalysis is to progress. Uh, it requires overcoming our narcissism, opening ourselves to the views of the others, carefully weighing their views in light of the evidence. In order to achieve this, one has to always be asking what is not being said, what is the opposite of what is being said, is there any truth, in what the other side is saying. Of course, in the process of analysis, one is interested in one's dreams and one's slips because one's slips of the tongue often express the other side of a split. And the dream is informing me of the other side of what I generally like to think about others, about myself. So psychoanalytic listening is often listening to the opposites, listening to the other side, listening to the other. This kind of psychoanalytic practice, listening to the other, uh, is a kind of preparation for democracy, which depends on a capacity to listen carefully to the other and to weigh the evidence. Maybe I'm wrong about some of my key assumptions. Maybe the opponents are right about a few things. I need to be open to these possibilities and I need to be considering them. Some schools of psychoanalytic thought uh, argue that uh, a conception of psychoanalysis as trying to get at the reality uh, is, is essentially authoritarian. In other words, they assume that the uh, analyst is going to impose his notion of what reality is upon the patient. Um, that there's this authoritarianism built in. The analyst is seen to be assuming he has some sort of privileged access to reality that the patient doesn't have. And of course, this need not be the case at all. A democratically operating analysis is one which works on the assumption that two heads are better than one. Sometimes the patient may be closer to the reality than the analyst. 
And sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes the patient will help me correct my understanding of something, and sometimes I will help the patient correct his or her understanding. So it's, it's a dialogue between us, a democratic dialogue between us, in which we help each other test reality more and more accurately. And as a result of this kind of analytic process, we both grow. So I reject entirely the notion that to avoid authoritarianism in analysis, we have to throw out the idea of an objective reality. Of course, uh, in keeping with Sir Karl Popper, none of us ever entirely uh, arrive at an understanding of objective reality. All we have are approximations to a reality that is ultimately incompletely knowable, but we can make progress together through dialogue. Of course, that's what science is. It's an ongoing dialogue within a scientific community trying to arrive at better and better approximations to an ultimately incompletely knowable truth. And I think this plays a significant role in the psychoanalytic process. And of course, this is always a matter of more or less. No one entirely gets free of their illusions. Um, there's no such thing really as a final analysis. As long as one lives, one is learning more and more about oneself, hopefully, and learning more and more about the others, the significant others. Um, there's no end. Uh, to this growth. But in practical terms, there is a large difference between a person who is wandering around largely unconscious, having never uh, had any analysis, and a person who has spent a few good years in an analytic struggle to understand himself or herself more deeply. Hopefully, at the end of such a good analysis, a person's reality testing is greatly enhanced. And of course, I don't mean that such enhanced reality testing leads to uh, a pessimistic, dark, tragic vision of life. Um, the old cartoon uh, in which the character goes through a series of adventures and in the last frame of the cartoon uh, he's depicted as sadder but wiser and certainly the old style Freudians liked that cartoon as a kind of a, uh, epitomizes a, epitomizing a good analytic process you surrender illusions you end up sadder but wiser uh, I don't agree um, sometimes after a good analytic process uh, when one ends up uh, happier and wiser. I agree with the wiser part, but it doesn't always need to end in a dark, tragic vision. That's a split. Life contains tragedy and darkness, but it also contains joy and love and happiness. And so, again, in my view, enhanced reality testing is an enhanced capacity to see both sides now. Nor does a good analysis result in social adaptation. Uh, I could well imagine an Edward Snowden being in analysis and deciding that he needs to be a whistleblower. Some people can be helped by analysis <coughs> to be a rebel. Sometimes an analysis can help one overcome one's inhibitions. It can help one mobilize one's aggression. It can help one confront situations assertively. Um, so Far from leading necessarily to social adaptation, uh, a good analysis can sometimes 
help a person deviate, become deviant from a sick society, uh, refuse the kind of alienation that may be involved in social adaptation, and embrace health, uh, which may very much lead one to become estranged from a society which has succumbed to ill health or to social injustice. I think Eric Fromm is probably the analyst who most adequately portrays this aspect of the analytic process. I'm thinking of his book, The Sane Society, which is really a book about insane societies and the struggle to be sane in an insane society. I think it was Bertrand Russell who said there are some societies in which the only place a decent person can be is in jail. And certainly a good analytic process is uh, a process that may well liberate a person to deviate from the society around them, not necessarily conform or adapt to it.